why do we do 100 percent texas well, why do we do grace from texas like what else is there I think we can go pound for pound on quality with anybody in the world. Anybody in the world. I just thought to myself, I have to get into this industry, no matter what it takes. Um, this is amazing. I need to get into this industry and I want to make a, a wine like that. We're here. We've been here. We can stand shoulder to shoulder with everyone. The proof is in the pudding. The pudding has been around. I'm over it. The, the brand of Texas itself is unique and special, and as Texans, we need to be proud of it. Texas is unique in that it is one of the only states, if you put the outline, not you don't even have to put the letters, you don't have to spell T-E-X-A-S, you can do the outline of our state onto something, and that is recognized all over the world. The first 15 to 20 years of any industry, whenever you've actually put a, a, a focused effort into growth, is all experimental. And so we're, we basically, like I like mentioned in early 2000s into 2010, that was right as we were exiting that period. The last time people tasted Texas wine, roughly eight years ago, it wasn't premium, right? Really, it's like we're pissed. We're pissed that we're growing great grapes and there could be so much potential in Texas, but people weren't really paying attention to the vineyards. You know, and they, they walk up to a bottle of wine or in a wine bar somewhere, and I'm sure they're expecting it to taste like gunpowder or something like that, because it's Texas. Since the 70s and the 80s, we are improving our quality of the wines. But, but early on, they were, they were not that high quality. In the early years, it was a rough time. Uh, Texas has always been a pioneer state, and uh, we've always had kind of a rough history with that as well. Hey, you ain't done yet? Not by a long shot. <laughs> 
Get you, stranger. What you got? Got tequila, whiskey, even cold beer if that's your fancy. Got a wine list. <laughs> Mister, did I just hear you correctly? Did you just say wine? Wine, wine as in wine. Texas wine. <laughs> <laughs> Texas gets double goals all over the world, San Francisco, Chicago, I mean it doesn't matter where you go, San Diego, we get double goals left and right, but we never do get any, get any recognition for it, you know, the old saying, we don't get no respect. I didn't know much about wine, and I thought it would be fun to maybe plant some grapes and make wine. I didn't, I didn't realize how difficult it was at every level. If the quality of the wine in Texas is good, everybody stands to benefit from that. So it makes sense to support each other and, and try to come up with the best quality wine possible in these conditions. Katie Jane and I probably use the reference more than others, but um, we're okay being the underdog. And we're okay being the dark horse. We are okay with that, but don't under, do not underestimate us. I do think that the 2000s was a breakout period, um, and then by 2010 we started gaining that recognition, and so now you're seeing between 2010 and 2020 really kind of a renaissance of Texas wine. And when we got started and got interested in wine growing in, in, in the early, early 80s, there were about a dozen wineries in Texas, and now I understand there's somewhere around 600. So it's been a huge boom because the, the genie was let out of the bottle, literally. And the industry has grown immensely by a thousand percent in the last 20 years. And since they've allowed wineries in dry counties, which most of Texas is now wet, but went from 70 wineries in 2002, there's over 600 now in 2020. So now in Texas, we're growing things like Montepulciano, Aglianico. Uh, we do Trebbiano, we do some Vermentino. Like Morvedro, Sangiovese, Tanat. Cabs, Marlos. Lenoir and Blanc de Bois. There's a lot of different varietals that the consumer is not really familiar with. And it actually is a really exciting thing, especially for kind of the younger generation because they kind of expand their palates and taste new things. I find it um, interesting that, you know, Texas is really now coming into its own with its identity because we're going beyond the experimental phase of grape growing. We're still, still doing that to some extent, but people are now settling upon grapes that they really think are going to do well in their specific vineyard or their region, and they're starting to grow those. And I think having that confidence is very important for the growth of the industry. You know, we, we've, we've got, we're still finding our identity for sure. And it's kind of fun to be a part of that. Thank you. 
I think the main thing for Texas was figuring out which are the varieties of grapes that do best here. Because as a grape and wine producer, you might be tempted to make wines that are you know, well known around the world as Cabernet Sauvignon or Riesling or Chardonnay. Um, everybody knows uh, those wines and they're easier to sell be because they are so well known. But sometimes these grapes may not do that well in certain um, climatic conditions such as the ones in Texas. So figuring out the grapes that do best here was a big step. People, we're not trying to make California style wines. We're not trying to make French style wines. We're trying to grow Texas wines. And we've got to develop our own styles. Our, our whole climate region, if you look at the actual globe, we're really tied in with Spain and Italy. And so we're seeing a lot of those varietals are actually growing really well in certain areas. Uh, but again, we have influence from like the Guadalupe Mountains down the Davis Mountains. In the Texas High Plains, we have some frost sometimes and some hail. But we also have that nice that natural shift where we have the cold evenings, we have that whole phenolic ripeness. Then down here in the hill country, we have a very fast growing region, but we have all the limestone soils. It gives just that minerality and that beautiful actual, uh, almost like French-esque, not quite as like the, uh, the regions of Champagne. But you, you can kind of tweak each vineyard, but you have to treat them very individually. Uh, the relationships we have and knowing where the, the wine is grown, because um, to me that's everything. Like that's, that's why we started a winery, is we wanted to share with people what Texas tastes like. And there's so many really cool places uh, to, to taste wine. There's so many, so many different terroirs that you can taste across the state. Um, that are really incredible. I mean, just where I'm standing right now, I mean, we're in the Pertinalis River Valley, which, you know, is so cool. The river's right there. And then right over that ridge is a whole different geological platform. There's, um, there's the, 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 the Llano Uplift, you know, where it's all decomposed granite over sandstone. Some of the most cool soil so it's right over that ridge and we farm over there too. And then we farm over there in the decomposed ground. You know, like we have this like super awesome gift in Texas where there's all these bitching places to grow grapes and they're all different. And then, you know, we go four hours, five hours away and we get to farm in the high plains and, and, and work with some amazing families. Well, yes, we've had a, a great response from people from all over the world. Um, our wine is imported at, at dinners at the James Beard House in New York uh, 12 times. Uh, our wine has been served at dinners for three presidents, a total of about 10 times, uh, including President Putin when he was at the famous dinner at the ranch uh, with President George W. Bush. So we've had a lot of uh, unusual people drinking our wine. It was poured for the King of Spain, I mean, for the President of Spain. It was poured for the King of Spain when, and Queen when they were in San Antonio uh, last year. So it's, it's been a, an exciting, unexpected course for us. We have 18 varieties. I could name them all for you, but I won't. So we grow what suits our sites, what is the best for our terroir. And it, the most simple way to say it is Mediterranean or hot weather grapes, right? Most of what people can't pronounce. It's not the Cab Merlot Chardonnay. It is the Morved and the Viognier. And for us, we have two flagships. On our whites, it's Malvasia Bianca and on our red, Kunwas. Why, what I'm doing right now, instead of doing Cabernet, Merlot, Chardonnay, it's too hot here, so that sort of got me on that, on that path to what we, what we really need to grow out here. We currently make 85 different wines from 33 varieties of grapes, and I consider to be that um, those all perform incredibly well at particular vineyard sites in particular areas of the state. Now, after 23 years, we are about 350 acres plus with 38 different varieties. Most of our soils are sandy loams on the top three feet. Below that, we have a calcareous nature of the cleachy, very porous. Even if we get a two to three inches rain, next morning, we, our tractors can go and plow the land. That, that beautiful water penetration into the the soil. So we now have about 50 acres of grapes planted here, uh, but because our production is now 140,000 cases, we have wonderful growers uh, in north in West Texas, primarily from uh, Mason County, 
to Lubbock Brownfield Plains, Tokyo, Texas. Uh, and they're, they are very committed to the type of wine that we're trying to make, which means that the fruit has to be pretty perfect. Somewhere between 80 and 85 percent of the wine grapes in, in Texas are grown here on the High Plains, which is probably an hour's drive from Lubbock in any direction. I think we have to consider that Texas is both a historically important state for wine, but also an emerging state for wine and it's a it's a weird dichotomy for the state because on the one hand the business here goes the, the, the wine making industry here goes back several hundred years on the other hand the modern history of Texas wine really only started in the 1970s that's young well I mean just because my dad was growing them out here since 1968 he saw what would do and what wouldn't do, but you know, back in those days, you know, either you had to grow Cabernet or Merlot and Chardonnay because that's really what all people understood. And so, when you were growing these other varieties, uh, you were not lying. You're not going to be. It's going to be a tough sale. Tough sale. You know, in the beginning, uh, Messina Hoff was you know one of the first four wineries uh, in the state. In the 1970s, really being able to be a pioneer and a spearhead to be able to help grow Texas wine, and so it was an inspiration. Um, Messina Hoff was a huge inspiration to help grow Texas wine, and to help uh, other wineries uh, be able to feel confident to be able to start growing and inspire growers to plant grapes. Well, when we started uh, in 1990, when we bought the property, uh, there were maybe 20 or 25 active wineries in Texas. There were others that weren't very active or, or others that were going out of business. Now there are over 500 wineries. So that's happened just between 1990 and 2019. I mean, I got here in 2017. That's about four years ago, um, almost. The industry was on the um, uptick already. There were 200 something wineries, um, winery permits when I got here. There are 620, if I'm not mistaken, today, um, 2020. Horrible year. Uh, but anyways, um, uh, so a big increase in uh, winery permit numbers. From a quality standpoint, I think a lot of progress has been made both on the viticultural side and the enology side as well. Lately, Texas wines are recognized all over the world. They are getting double golds, international competition in San Francisco, even Houston international wine competition well, science, what we do as wine scientists is we try to solve problems, if there are problems for a particular region, um, and to improve um, the technological process so we increase the quality of the wine. Um, some problems are very applied, and one of such problems is the um, acidity problem in Texas. Um, because of the heat here, grapes tend to lose acidity um, during the ripening process, and so the, the pH increases, and that leads to a, um, a number of problems um, for wine quality, from color to taste to microbiological stability. So that's a problem that needs to be fixed. So me as a scientist, I come in and I try to find a solution to that problem. And if I'm successful, then the wines will be better because the pH will decrease, the acidity will increase, they'll be fresher, they'll be more stable, uh, the color will be better, the tannins will be better. So that's a very, you know, um, pointed problem and pointed solution to that problem. Now I think the Texas wine industry is really on a cusp. Uh, we're really getting there where we're finding making more quality wines, more intense wines, and, and more kind of what the consumer kind of perceives, but there's a lot of education still to have. And I think the more we expand our viticulture knowledge, uh, really because the grape growers make the most beautiful wines. 
as long as we just kind of come in as a winemaker and really expand that off. Uh, and honestly, it's a really fun time to be in this industry because right now we're really expanding. We're getting a lot of notice. We're getting a lot of intrigue, you know, even internationally. And so it's really kind of a fun time to be involved. People come in here with low expectations because it's Texas wine and they leave with a smile on their face. That's one of the best feelings in the world is to make somebody's day. I mean, they just go, whoa, when did this happen? Well, where have you been, you know? I think in, in knowing what I know, that we're just gonna break the mold and we're not going to do things how other wine growing regions have. And we're going to be the rebels and we're going to be the outcast for a little bit, which I feel like we already have been. <laughs> We're not going to have issues with phylloxera, uh, which was a, you know, a disease that almost decimated, um, you know, the European grape industry. Texas helped save it. That's a whole other story. A TV Munson, he's the father of American viticulture, and almost no one knows that. He, you know, he won't get no respect either because he's from Texas. Um, so it wasn't that the Americans brought the American um, grapes into Europe. It was European brought the American grapes into Europe, not realizing what's going to happen because with the grapes and with the soil on the on the roots came phylloxera and that spread everywhere and decimated the European vineyards. We saved France, right? The TV Munson story. So France was plagued with phylloxera, which is a disease that gets in the ground that ruins vineyards. and. Um, the government, the Legion of France, sourced a well-known botanist, Thomas Volney Munson, to fix it. And he did that by taking um, rootstock, basically from the ditches, bar ditches, burrow pits, whatever you want to say it, from, and different rootstocks from all over of Texas, putting them on barges, taking them to France, they grafted them, they were PD resistant, okay? And they saved the vineyards. They were getting up in the morning and burning vineyards faster than you could shake a stick at to try and stop the disease. So the bulk of vineyards in certain provinces in France are the result of Texas rootstock. There is literally a monument statue that loosely translates, God bless Texas, right? I joke about it, it's a thank you from the Tex or from the French Legion, the French government, thanking Texans for saving, <laughs> at that time, their vineyards. If you don't like the weather, just wait five minutes, it'll change. The climate, yeah, definitely questionable and can, can rip you a new one anytime it really wants to. <laughs> Most of our rain and weather comes from thunderstorm events, so sometimes they can be quite violent, and, and it always rains, you know, hard. We never do, rarely get these nice showers that last for hours and hours, they just come. So, so here we, we've given up disease and insect pressure for, for you know, severe weather issues. That's our main, main uh, issues. To repeat, a tornado is on the ground. Take cover now. Move to a basement or an interior room on the lowest floor of a sturdy building. Avoid windows. If you are outdoors, in a mobile home, or in a vehicle, move to the closest substantial shelter and protect yourself from flying debris. To report severe weather, contact your nearest law enforcement agency. We will send your report to the National Weather Service Office in Midland. You know, every, every third year we're getting our asses handed to us by either, you know, winter freeze or multiple spring frost. And, you know, the frost that we had were more what they call an advective frost, where it's just like cold, dry air mass coming straight down. And you just sit there and kind of cry, you know, or drink <laughs> or both. Yeah, well, I think, I think that's a key to the Texas wine industry right now is getting the word out. Mm -hmm. 
And whether that's in our state, because let's face it, there are a lot of people in the state of Texas that don't even realize the quality of wine being made here right now, or whether that's moving beyond the borders to other states, to other countries, you know, to go internationally, the word needs to get out because the quality of the wine is there and the camaraderie of the people is there. The question is, how do we get the word out to more people? I feel like we're missing a market. I feel like we're, we're missing an audience in our own state. I feel like that there are so many people in our own backyard that don't know that we're out here growing grapes. They, they don't know that this little county out here in West Texas grows more grapes per capita than anywhere else in the state. They don't know that. For us to make wines that will win national prizes in San Francisco, which we were very fortunate this week to have two double gold and five gold medals against all the West Coast wines, uh, the, the fruit quality is everything. Well, I guess for the people out there who are not from um, Texas and they're going to watch this, come down to Texas. Uh, we'll take you for barbecue and some awesome Texas wine. I will give you the Texas hospitality, right? And you'll see for yourself how good our wines are. Fellers, I was just like you, I swear, until I tried it. Texas wine. Ain't no, Ain't no thing Texas wine. And there's more than you might realize. Let me bring some in here. You can have a try. I want it. I want it where the common man can get our wine. We get we get people from all over that visit our, our winery locations and want to taste Texas wine. You know, I almost don't want to tell anybody about it because, like, I like it the way it is, but I know that it's coming. You know, and the people that know about it understand. This is the best thing I've ever drank. <laughs> Yeah. 